Hey everyone, super excited for this chat today with Aporto, who are reinventing the cloud desktop space. Uh, Anthony, how are you? I'm doing great. Thank you, Evan. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Spring here in Boston. I see your sunny Palo Alto, where it's always summer. But uh, really excited to have you on today. You're doing some very innovative work uh, evolving the needs of the network to this new hybrid work environment. And I have lots of questions on that. Before then, maybe introduce yourself a little bit about your entrepreneurial journey and uh, your current mission at Aporta. Yes, thank you, Evan. So uh, about 10 years ago, as you mentioned, uh, we were uh, started in uh, Palo Alto. And we started talking to local universities like Stanford. UCLA is not exactly local. But anyway, we started talking to <laughs> universities to understand their needs when it comes to virtualization. And they told us that though there were virtualization solutions out there, obviously there are some big names in the space, none of them were focused on the specific needs of higher education. Hmm. So we decided that that was an interesting challenge. Um, so we started writing code and we must have been lucky um, or smart. <laughs> Uh, but now we have some 250 universities around the country, around North America, and a smaller number, obviously, in the UK who are using our service. Oh, that's a fantastic accomplishment. Uh, what was it about their environment that was so differentiated or unique uh, that, you know, legacy or current solutions weren't able to meet that need? That's a really good question. So the whole thing about virtual desktop is about privacy. The reason customers, you know, embrace uh, environments like Citrix and VMware is to enable a very private use of data. But mm. in higher education, the use case was very different. It was not so much about privacy as much as it was about enabling students to remotely access the applications that they needed. In the sense that in a traditional computer lab environment, you have to have the students, you know, to take the example of UCLA, drive to the campus, which as you know, happens to be in a very busy part of town, find a parking spot, find an empty seat in the computer lab, use the application, drive home. And maybe that made sense in the 20th century, but in the 21st century, it didn't make a lot of sense. In the 21st century, students should be able to, any device they may have, even a totally underpowered device, maybe even a Chromebook, if that's what they got when they were in high school, point a browser to, you know, a portal through that browser, access the applications they need, even 3D applications like AutoCAD or SolidWorks or Adobe, and go about their business. Well, it's a pretty simple but compelling uh, proposition there. I, I guess the flip side of the coin there is cybersecurity. Uh, you know, how did you address some of the concerns those institutions had? What's your philosophy there as, as these organizations are particularly juicy targets for all kinds of security breaches? Mm -hmm. what, what, what are you doing there? Yeah, so uh, funny you mentioned that. Education tends to be a very prime target for bad actors mm. everywhere. Um, maybe they feel that the threshold of cybersecurity in education is lower. But what we've done there is that we deliver the virtual desktops always in the browser. And because mm. we deliver it in the browser, whereas traditional solutions require that you install a client and anytime you install a client, I have a friend, for instance, he is a partner at a law firm. And the entire law firm of, I don't know, 5,000 employees is under very strict instructions that even though they use virtualization, they are not able to plug a USB stick in the laptop because there has been right. instances where the malware travels from the USB stick to the client you know, that's running on the, you know, on the physical desktop to the server, and now you have some malware on the server. Because we run in the browser and only in the browser, the browser provides a much more isolated environment from the operating system. And therefore, from a security perspective, the universities don't have to worry anymore about 
what do students have on their physical desktop? Because we all know students are students and any malware that can be found out there, you will find it on students' <laughs> desktops. Sadly, so true. The other part of your value proposition is clearly uh, total cost of ownership. Uh, you, you know, you talk about the incredible savings that you offer. Um, uh, you know, how do you do that? What does the environment look like? And, and um, you, you know, how do you, how do you quantify that exactly with, with clients? Another really good question. So in a traditional environment, you would have to buy hardware to support the maximum number of users that you could have throughout the year. In a university, that happens maybe two, three times a year, right? At the end of the first semester, at the end of the second semester, maybe, you know, at the end of the third semester. You have huge spikes. And now if you buy the hardware to support those huge spikes, you have oversized hardware that's mm. very underutilized the rest of the year. Because we're cloud native, we add capacity on the fly when there's need for more capacity. We remove that capacity when it's not needed. And, you know, we're paying for the capacity when it's needed. So that enables mm. us to save significantly over traditional environments for our customers who have those varying workloads. Well, it seems pretty obvious, but it's, it's great to hear. So as you know, better than I, the cloud desktop market has been around for quite a long time. It's sort of been a long time coming. I think we were, you know, uh, uh, Oracle at the same time that Larry was talking about cloud desktops many, many years ago. But the market has arrived, um, but there are still hurdles to overcome. What typically do you see as the challenges, the roadblocks, barriers to cloud desktop deployment? So in, in my view, the two bigger imp biggest impediments are the user experience and the cost. In the sense that if you take a user and tell them, you know, we're going to replace your physical desktop with a cloud desktop, depending on their location and depending on the network that they're using, you know, there may be latency in the sense that when they move the mouse, you know, that mm. may not, there may be like, I don't know, 10 milliseconds, so 20 milliseconds, 30 milliseconds. And at a certain threshold, typically around 50 milliseconds, the user experience deteriorates. So users do not like that. So that's number one. And cost, um, you know, if you have an under-optimized environment in the cloud, surprisingly, it does not achieve a lot of savings over having users, uh, you know, having their own desktop. So yeah. those are the two challenges we see out there. And, you know, we believe we have uh, resolved the first one. And I'll tell you in a little bit how we've resolved that. And the second one, you know, there's still more work to be done, but we've made huge progress in that area as well. Well done. That's uh, no small feat. And how do you, as a you know emerging company surrounded by tech giants, how do you try to stay ahead in this evolving marketplace? Uh, you're surrounded by big tech out there in uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, what's your secret there? We so really we are all about customer int intimacy. I mean, we cannot mm. compete with the giants when it mm. comes to brand recognition. Um, but if, you know, if when we identify a customer segment, a, a segment of the market, um, we can very quickly turn around and deliver unique capabilities to that segment of the market, whereas it would take somebody like Amazon or Microsoft, mm. as I'm sure you know. I mean, for those, mm. you know, it's like you, you have a big ship to turn it around. It takes a long, long time, a lot of energy. For us, we turn on a dime. We deliver the functionality that those customers need. They greatly appreciate it. We deliver great service. So it's all about customer intimacy. Well, you make it sound so easy. If only it were behind the scenes. I'm, I'm sure there's a little more yeah. to it than that. But it it's uh, it's exciting. I mean, directionally, you're clearly headed in in the the direction the industry is following. But what, what are some of the trends, opportunities that you're going to be riding over the next couple of years in terms of, you know, the roadmap and the business? 
So during COVID, as you can imagine, we got a huge boost um, mm. thanks to COVID. I'm sorry to put it in those terms, but as you can imagine, most Badly universities... Is the reality, yeah. Yeah, most workplaces needed remote access to applications, to software. So obviously that, you know, uh, we, we rode that wave. And now we do, there's a lot of turmoil in the marketplace. I mean, I'm sure mm. uh, some of your listeners are reading about what's happening with VMware being acquired by Broadcom. Uh, we're hearing about customers who are seeing their bills increase, you know, threefold, fivefold, tenfold. Uh, Citrix was acquired by a private equity company. And again, you know, this morning I was reading the register and they mentioned there is a twofold price increase. Irrespective, you know, there's a lot of turmoil there. Anytime you have a private equity that's running a company, you know, they look at everything through the lens of a spreadsheet. And, you know, that can result in some dysfunctional decisions. So that's creating very significant opportunities for us. And for that matter, we've just introduced what we call a Porto Next Gen, which enables customers to swap out their traditional le legacy VDI environment that they run on local hardware and swap in a Porto. And what's unique is that we're offering it at the cost of the tech support that they were paying last year. So if your last year's support bill was, I'm making this number up, let's say $15,000, $20,000, and now you're being presented by five times, 10 times that amount, it doesn't matter. You can come to us and say, this was my bill last year. We'll swap your software or, you know, and we'll swap in our software for the price that you paid last year for tech support. Well, it's a pretty uh, compelling offer. Uh, talk about the team you've built. You, you're a pro. You've been at this for many decades. Uh, talk about you know the culture you've built and the innovation engine. And um, it looks like you're growing as well. Yes. So uh, when we started, we are um, Silicon Valley veterans, so to say. <laughs> And we decided that we wanted to be not run by a spreadsheet. We wanted to be run, <laughs> you know, in as a go-to basics uh, company. So we're 100% employee owned. Wow. Um, we listen very, very intently to our customers. In fact, um, if you look at our Gartner reviews, and those are reviews that are, you know, vetted by Gartner before they're published on their website. 100% of our customers recommend our service. Um, so uh, again, customer intimacy is core to it, being able to turn on a dime. And some of the secret sauce is that we've used the latest and greatest technology. So we use containers, we use Kubernetes and microservices, and this enables us to add functionality very, very rapidly and respond to emerging customer needs very, very quickly. Oh, very exciting. Well, it sounds like you're a little bit of the best kept secret out there in some industries, maybe healthcare and, and others could really use your technology. A lot of challenges there. Uh, what are you excited about over the next couple of months as we head into the spring, uh, busy event season, lots of travel? What's on your agenda? Just um, responding to all these customers that are coming and telling us, you know, we can't afford our legacy solutions, new price, mm -hmm. um, can you help out? I think if we respond to those guys in a timely and, uh, you know, effective manner, uh, that's another great way for us that we can ride. And, um, you know, to the satisfaction of those customers, and obviously it will make our company an even more valuable, bigger company. Well, onwards and upwards. Congrats, <clears throat> Congrats on all the success. Thank I you. I noticed you went to MIT. Do you make it back on alumni trips or do you get back to Cambridge anytime? I, I, do, I do get back to Cambridge. I try to go back to Cambridge uh, in the summer. I spent a few, <laughs> couple of years at MIT and uh, I, I must say I enjoyed Boston very, very much. The weather, not so much, which is why I well, settled in Northern California. Um, yeah, otherwise but, known as paradise weather-wise. But um, yeah, maybe I'll catch you on one of your next trips over to Massachusetts. 
and what, we'll grab a beer on the. Uh, I'm on the North Shore, but we'll we'll grab a beer in Kendall Square. So, congratulations on uh, all the success and uh, continued success. Take care, Anthony. Thank you, Evan. Bye bye. Thanks for watching, everyone. Bye bye.